All right, so as I already mentioned this morning, we're continuing the series on the attributes of God. And this evening's sermon is going to be on God's omniscience. Um, the word omniscient just means that God knows everything. And I, I know I hit on this already a little bit this morning, just because when we're talking about some of these attributes, like God's omnipotence, which means his, his all-powerful, his mightiness, they, they all kind of play together in a way, uh, with, with, especially with many of the actions, or sometimes we'll read stories about God, that his omnipotence and his omniscience go hand in hand together with knowing everything and acting on it at the same time and just doing mighty things. So um, this morning, I already made um, an illustration regarding this story in Daniel chapter 2, but I wanted to start off in this story because this does a really good job of demonstrating how God just knows absolutely everything and that there really is nothing hidden from him and that's another way we look at god's omnipresence which i, I very clearly proved from scripture that god is everywhere he doesn't just know everything because he's everywhere and like can actually like see it god just knows everything it's just part of god's knowledge he knows the beginning from the end he knows he knows what you're going to do tomorrow before you know what you're going to do tomorrow because the whole thing, again, going to his eternity, is his eternal existence, which was another subject brought up this morning, which is why I try to preach these close together so we could kind of get the full picture and really understand as much as we can about God, how um, he's outside of time. So he, he has full knowledge of it. God knows everybody that's, that is going to get saved, and he knew that in the past and we're going to get into that's going to be kind of the last point that that we touch on is the is god's foreknowledge and foreordination and choosing of people based on that information and the more we understand about god it, this actually will help us to not get sucked into some false doctrines that exist out there because i think when you understand god's omnipotence his omniscience his eternity you know his omnipresence, and, and you really start to, to grasp how these all work together, it's going to help you not to get sucked into things like Calvinism because this in itself provides perfectly reasonable explanations for some passages that Calvinists like to twist and take out of context or just kind of take their meaning to, to a, a further extent than they're really meant to be taken to. Uh, we saw that already this morning when we are talking about God's omnipotence and how powerful he is and we can see examples of God stepping in but just because you see examples of God stepping in and saying well I'm gonna set these rulers up and I can do this it doesn't mean that he's just always interfering and stepping in every single time in every single aspect of every single person's life that's just simply not the case we see it happening and we know that God is gonna make sure that his will is done in many instances but at the same time we know that not all of god's will is just done all the time and that's evident when you read passages like the, god's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance god's will is that everyone would get saved but guess what not everybody's saved so is god is all of god's perfect will always being done on this earth no that's why jesus christ himself said in the, in his prayer the Lord's Prayer, right, the, that, that he was instructing his disciples on how to pray. He says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So is God's will being done in heaven? Yes, it is. Is God's will always being done here on earth? No, it isn't. Does God sometimes step in and say, my will is going to be done on earth? Yes, he does. But is it always? No. And that's where the Calvinist just, just goes off the deep end into just saying, well, no, God's sovereign and all this, you know, it just happens all the time. And they'll point to verses where we can see God's omnipotence and where he does intervene and step in as just proof that this just happens all the time. And it doesn't. So, but I'll get more into that at the end of the sermon. That's where I have it kind of segmented in to, to get into that a little bit more detail because this really is important. Uh, everything that we're doing here, all these sermons, hopefully, I hope you don't think it's, it's too boring kind of going through this stuff. Maybe it's stuff you've already known, but it's good to see this stuff. It's good to get foundational truths, and it's good to know why we believe them from the Bible. Because like I said, you have people who will, philosophers and just theologians and random people just say, oh, God's omnipotent, you know, and you hear this over and over again, 
But just because you hear something over and over again doesn't mean you should always accept it. Now, in these cases, these are all true facts. These are, these are true attributes. But let's look at Scripture and let the Bible explain and show us why and how these things are and how they exist and to what extent and, and all that. So we started with Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2 because I think this is a really good example of how God just knows everything. Here we have a guy, we have a king, Nebuchadnezzar, who has this dream and it really bothers him. He wakes up from this dream and he's just troubled about it and he's, his, his spirit's just not sitting right. But the dream, he just, he just can't remember what it was. I'm not the type of person who remembers very many dreams at all, but I know exactly what this feeling is. It's like, man, I was just dreaming something. It was just so vivid and it was so real. And then it's just like, what was it? Like, I don't know what it was. This is where Nebuchadnezzar is. And he's just like, I need to know what this is. And I need to know what this dream means because he knows it's really important. But he just can't put his finger on it. So look down. We're going to reread part of this passage. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. He's like, I need to know what this is. Then spake the Chaldeans, the king, and Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. So they're like, great. Just let us know what the dream was, and we'll tell you what it means, because you want to know what it means. Verse five. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. <laughs> Talk about getting a little extreme there. <laughs> like, I mean, this guy really wants to know what the dream is. But I also think it shows a little bit of, of his patience wearing thin with these people because I, I think that Nebuchadnezzar to some degree realizes that he's surrounded by a bunch of charlatans. He's surrounded by these astrologers and these stargazers and these, these people that, that use their divining enchantments and things like that to kind of tell them, oh yeah, here's what it means. So they've just been blowing smoke the whole time, just telling them whatever they want to tell them because they can, because he's asking for an interpretation. So they're just going to give them whatever interpretation they feel like. And now he's just like, look, and we're not going to read the whole rest of this, but basically he's saying, you know what? If you guys can't tell me what the dream is, then how can I even believe you what the interpretation is anyways, right? Like, what you want, why don't you just show me something real here and show me that you can tell me even what the dream is and the interpretation. You tell me what the dream is, I'll, I'll listen to your interpretation of it. But he goes so far as to say, and if you don't, <laughs> you know, you're going to die. And they're like freaking out, which I understand that. Like, hey, look, no one's ever, ever done this before. Like, you're asking something. <laughs> <laughs> that no one in the history of mankind has ever, no king has ever asked to know what their dream was. Like, you dreamed it. I didn't. I don't know. But, but it's a good point because, I mean, think about these stupid, like all these ESP, these, these tarot card readers, these psychics, right? It's like, oh, I saw this and I had these premonitions and I can see that. And I can see Why aren't you going and buying your winning lottery ticket then, huh? How come you're not, you know, like... Like, you're not doing anything real significant with all the knowledge. You're just waiting for some sucker to come in and give you a bunch of money to, to just hear whatever it is that you have to say because uh, they've got some, some superstition and, uh, and just want someone to tell them things they want to hear. And those people, they, they never are telling people like, hey, you're going to die. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like you ever heard of a, of a psychic? Someone goes into them being like, like, yeah, it's really bad news for you. Like, like next week, you're going to die. And it never, that never happens. There's always things that, oh, this person over here, that you're going to, you know, some good thing's going to happen or whatever. It's never, why? Because people want to keep coming back and hearing those things and then have it explained to them why it didn't exactly work. Oh, well, because this must have happened over here and it, you know, it's a bunch of nonsense. So anyways, I don't want to get off on, onto that, that tangent. This is where the king's at. He's saying he had this dream that no, he didn't talk to anyone about it. No one knows this dream, just him himself. And even he forgot the dream. So Daniel finds out about this. Daniel doesn't want to die because he's considered as like one of the wise men that was surrounded by, the, you know, the king surrounded himself with. So he would be one of the people that's going to be put to death if they can't do this thing along with all those other charlatans. And uh, verse 17, the Bible says, Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. So uh, he, he lets these other guys know, hey, this is what's going on. 
And basically, he tells them so that they could all pray to God and ask God to show mercy on them and to reveal this truth. They know that they can go to God. See, this is a great example of someone knowing, hey, there's a God that knows everything. There's a God that has all knowledge. And this means if I can't find this knowledge, I'm going to be put to death. Who do you go to? Well, there's one place to go to. God. God, we know that you know everything. Can you please... Please give me this information. Spare our lives, Lord. We're here to serve you. Please share this. Go to the, go to the one that can make the impossible possible. Have the faith to go to God. God, please reveal this thing to us. And God is willing to reveal all manner of secrets to us. I mean, we, if, if you want to have knowledge, you want to understand what's right, God's the one that can give that to you. But let's read here, verse number 18. Uh, that they would desire mercies of God of, of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So God answers their prayers. God, God gives Daniel the vision. Daniel receives a vision. He, Thank you, God. Right? Verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And I brought this up this morning, the same verse, uh, because of the might part, that he's mighty. But look at that, wisdom, knowledge. God knows everything. Wisdom belongs unto God. Verse 21, And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. Saying God knows all these. God knows secret things. He knows all the secrets. He knows all the stuff that goes on in the dark. He knows everything because he's all-knowing. Keep reading. Verse number 23. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon, he went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. So basically Daniel goes to Arioch, and Arioch's like, All right, we've got to get you in before the king right away, because the king's mad, he's ready to start chopping off heads. Right? And he's like, all right, well, I found somebody. We got someone that's going to show you the interpretation so we could hold off on killing everybody. Verse number 26, because I'm sure Ariak didn't really want to do this either. He's probably like, man, I got to kill all these people. because." <laughs> Verse 26, the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. He's saying, you know what? These clowns, these guys over here, you call them your wise men, they can't show this to you. They'll never be able to show this unto you because they're a bunch of phonies and frauds. Now, obviously, I'm adding a little bit to that, but the reason why, this is, in essence, what he's demonstrating to the king. I mean, this is the point he's getting across to him. That's why he mentions, you know what? All of these guys, they can't do this. Because they're not operating under the power of God. They're not going to the God of heaven and earth. They're not going to the Lord for this information. They're just deceiving you anyways with whatever they want to. You consider them wise men, they're really not. They can't do this. There's only one that can provide the answer that you're looking for, and that's God. He says in verse 28, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. So I'm not going to go on with the rest of the interpretation, but basically what we see here from Daniel, first of all, Daniel is not taking any of the credit for himself. Just like any of the great men of God, when God is helping them out, like when David fought Goliath, he's not saying, oh yeah, well I'm tougher than you are, and I'm stronger than you, and I'm a man of war. He was saying, you know what? 
You come to me with a sword and a spear. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, you know, whom ye defy. So you're defying the, the, the children of Israel. You're defying the God of Israel. So God's going to give me the victory. God's going to give your, your head into my hand. God is going to fight for me. And even after he wins, he doesn't take all the glory to himself. He says, God did it. Daniel's doing the same exact thing here. Daniel's saying, you know what? It's not my own smarts. It's not my own wisdom. It's not because I'm just some really awesome guy that can just know all this stuff and have psychic powers and abilities. No, nope. there's a God. And he says, the only reason is because he says, uh, as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have any more than li any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation. He said, basically, it's for our sakes. The only reason you're even going to get to know this is because God loves us. <laughs> God cares about me, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's like, like, we're servants of God, and God is looking out for us and protecting us. This is why you're going to know God's going to give you the thoughts of thy heart. And right there, the Bible says that God is able to reveal the thoughts of the heart. So even the most personal things, like we don't know what's going on inside of anybody. We can't see the heart. I, I talk to people about this all the time. We're going out soul winning. You know, try to lead someone to Christ, and, and we're wrapping things up and say, you know what? I can't see your heart, especially after they pray. I don't know, you know, like, God can see your heart. You meant what you said right there. We just had this day. We prayed with someone, and I always ask them, well, you meant that, right? I mean, you meant, you meant that prayer to God? You're, you're putting your faith in Christ? Okay, well, God can see your heart. Like, I can't see your heart. I can't, because I don't like just pronouncing people saved. Even if everything just, just is on the up and up and, and, and everything seems right, I don't like just pronouncing somebody saved. I always just defer to God and just be like, well, you know what? God can see your heart. And if you put all of your faith in Jesus Christ right now, which I believe you did, then you're saved and you're going to heaven, right? I don't like walking away from people just pronouncing that because why? Because I can't see the heart. I've been fooled by people in the past that aren't saved, that I thought were saved. So I'll just leave people knowing, hey, you know what? God can see your heart. God knows. So any thought, any calling on the name of the Lord that's going on from your heart, God knows if it's real. God knows if it's genuine. And as long as it is, then great, you're saved. And I don't say that to put doubt in their, in their mind or in their heart, but it's just a matter of not confirming somebody that, that I really don't know. Um, but it's, it's amazing here that God knows the thought, you know, anything that you think is secret, anything, you know, the Bible says that the thought of foolishness is sin. Well, how could it be a sin if no one can know what those thoughts are? Well, God can know. Right? God knows our thoughts. God knows the thoughts of the heart. God knows everything. Flip over, if you would, to the book of Psalms. Look at uh, Psalm 94. I'm going to read Psalm 44, verse 20. This is a phrase, uh, and this concept comes up many times in Scripture. I'm, I'm going to, again, try not to belabor the point of how many times it's in Scripture, but I'm going to show you just a few passages that just talk about God knowing the secrets and thoughts and intents of the heart. Psalm 94. Psalm 44, I'm going to read for you while you're turning to Psalm 94. Psalm 44, verse 20. If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a strange God, shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. God knows our secrets. You don't have to tell anybody. God can see. God knows. Psalm 94, verse number 6. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. What a foolish people. He's referring to here people that are doing wicked things. They're, they're preying on people who are defenseless. They're preying on the widow, the fatherless, people who have nobody to stand up and protect them because they're easy targets and they're wicked people out to just get gain from these people. And these wicked people, in their mind, in their heart, they're thinking, hey, God's not going to see us. Who are these people? They, they can't complain to anyone. No one's going to find out about this. They think they could get away with whatever sins they want to do. Just because you could pull the wool over the eyes of some people, just because you may think you could get away with some crime and some murder in, in this day among human beings, you think you get away with stuff, you may be able to get away with it in front of man, but not before God, not ever before God. Because they view people as pieces of trash. They think God thinks the same way about it. Sorry, no, he doesn't. God actually has extra special place in his heart for the people who need the protection and the defending that don't have anybody or anything to help them out. Amen. He looks at them and he's going he's gonna to come down even harder on those that are abusing the defenseless, the children, the fatherless, the, the widows. 
Bible says here, verse 8, Understand ye brutish among the people, and ye fools. When will ye be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? Like, uh, hello, the guy who created the ear and formed and fashioned it and made it work the way it works, you think he can't hear when you say something? He that formed the eye, shall, not, shall he not see? He that chastiseth the heathen, shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall not he know? Look, the source of your knowledge is coming from above. It's coming from God. You think there's something that he's not going to know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity. God knows the thoughts. God knows the heart. God created these things. He knows. Flip over to um, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, I want you to see this. this is a great passage, a great verse in 1 John chapter 3. I'm going to read just one more verse for you from Luke chapter 16, verse 15. It ties in with the same concept that we saw in Psalm 94. Uh, Jesus said this, he says, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. These wicked people, they like to justify themselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And he's talking to you know, the Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers. They had this attitude. And they, they like to justify themselves before men. And they always have an excuse and a reason for, for their sin and what they're doing, why it's not wrong. So you know what? God knows your heart. Again, you may be able to, to trick people. But the, one of the reasons why understanding that God is all-knowing, it should influence the way that you behave and the way that you live. You should not be living your life just to persuade other people or to care about how you're viewed in the eyes of man. Even good men, even people, you know, even other church members, right? The, the way that you live your life is not, just, is not just designed to put on some show, to say the right things, to, to, to dress the right way or whatever just in front of other people so that you'll be accepted or gain friendships or whatever. The point is that God in heaven can see your heart. So it, this, it, what we do here, what we practice here, is not just some outward thing of putting on some front of here's how I dress and here's how I speak in church and here's how I, you know, it, no, it has to be coming from your heart. Because the exterior shell of whatever you can do on the outside is going to be meaningless if you've got a bad heart on the inside. That's what really, really, really matters. Get that heart right and let the heart push the outward things into the right direction as well. It's easy to get the outward appearance stuff fixed or corrected. It's a lot harder to work on the heart, but you know what? God looks at the heart. And you may be able to fool everyone else with your exterior, but you don't have to answer to everyone else. You only have to answer to God. So we need to remember that and remember that no matter how good you would look in the eyes of other people, you have to answer to God. Amen. And He's going to see your heart. I mean, think about, think about how many even real, legitimately saved, born-again people have put on shows of, of being so righteous in the eyes of man, but were involved in all manner of wickedness. Do you think that show mattered at all for anyone? No, not when, not when the heart is screwed up and wicked. No. That's what matters. And you know, it's all going to be found out anyways because God is a God of light. He brings things to light. And another thing to, to just be mindful of, remember these things. Don't allow yourself to get into, you know, wickedness even if you think you could get away with it in front, of, in front of man. Because God knows everything. God can see. And that's who you ought to really care about the most anyways, is your walk with God. We're trying to learn individual walks with God. Where did I have you turn to? I have you turn to 1 John chapter 3. Okay, look at what the Bible says here. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 19. 
The Bible says, And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. And I don't know if I read this for you yet. So in Luke 16, 15, I'll reread this because these are both tied together. I put these verse, I group these verses together because they're related. He just got done. Uh, Jesus just got done saying, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And then um, in 1 John chapter 3, 19, he's saying, Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. He's saying, We know that we're of the truth and, and our hearts, like, their hearts are kind of like testifying for them. He says, But if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. So at the end of the day, you know, even if you think you're, you're, you know, in your heart you feel like you're condemned of yourself, but I was saying, but God ultimately knows the truth and he really knows the heart. Because, you know, the heart can be deceitful. And even what you feel, the feeling you get in your heart isn't always right. And sometimes you might end up being more critical and more condemning of yourself, but God knows the truth, and God, God is greater even than your heart, and God is able to uh, provide. He knows all things. He knows all things. Now, I'm not saying that you know, every time you're critical of yourself, it's, you're, you're being overcritical, right? But that can happen, that, and, I, and I think that does happen sometimes, where people might be... Um, giving themselves too hard of a time and, and overly guilty on some things that maybe they shouldn't be. But um, either way, God, because God, no, praise God, he knows everything. He ultimately knows all things. And he's, he's greater even than our heart. Um, Matthew 6, turn if you would to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. I'm going to read for you from Matthew chapter 6. And, and again, Matthew chapter 6 is where Jesus is instructing his disciples on how to pray. Is where we find the Lord's Prayer. And another comforting piece of information from a God that knows everything, Jesus said this, he says, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. But be, ye, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. So as he's instructing the disciples how to pray, he's saying, you know what? God already knows what you need and what you want before you even go and ask him. That's cool. That's great. Think about that. Again, we're stuck in time. Things pop up in our life that we didn't know we were going to have a need, right? It's just like, man, sometimes it's just out of left field. Like, man, where did this come from? But guess what? God already knew that was going to happen. That can provide some extra comfort. Knowing that an all-knowing God, all, he already knew this stuff was going to happen. That will hopefully provide you a little bit more comfort thinking, you know what, there's a way out. Because this, this might have taken me by surprise, but it didn't take God by surprise. Not at all. Now, he still wants us to go through, you know, we might consider, well, why do we have to go through the exercise? If God already knows it, then why? Because God wants us to do it. Because God cares about what we actually do. So God still wants us, just because he knows what we want before we ask him, we still ask. Jesus just said, hey, you, your father knows what you need before you ask him, but then he tells them how to ask. Right? He, he instructs them on how to do it. He said, but here's how you do it. But it provides us with that comfort, knowing, hey, God knows all this stuff. So not only should we you know, fear God because he knows our hearts and he knows everything and we need to make sure that we're, we're doing what's right because God will see everything. On the flip side, hey, when bad things happen, God knows about it. So we could go to him in prayer and just, you know, there's another reason to just assume, well, God's already going to take care of this. When I was dealing with all the issues with losing my job and everything else and all this stuff that, yeah, I was kind of caught me by surprise, right? But the level of comfort was there because I was just thinking, well, God's going to do something else for me. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I mean, who knows what it is, but it's, it's enough to have the faith to say, well, you know, it took me by surprise. It's not going to take him by surprise. And I didn't think about it in those terms back then, but even now in hindsight, looking back, it's like, sure, that's another reason 
to have great faith in God because he already knows. He knows it all. So, sure, he knew, he knew before I was born that I was going to lose my job, right? And it happened. But he already had a, a plan and, and preparedness. So we could, you know, but I still prayed a lot <laughs> and asked God for help and to show me the right way and what to do. And, you know, but God knew what my needs were and God knows what your needs are. And, and, you know, let that just be an extra comfort to you be, that he does know everything. Psalm 139, as you turn to Psalm 139, look at verse number one. The Bible says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. So you, know, you know when I sit down. You know when I get up. You know my thoughts even afar off. You know everything. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Talk about, you know, spelling out how God just knows everything about us. Verse number five, thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. You know what's amazing about all of this? And we're going to see this if you want to turn, uh, flip just over to Psalm 147. I'm going to read Luke 12 for you. I'm going to read these verses first, and then I'm going to just, when I, when I thought about this, it just kind of blows me away. It blows my mind away about how awesome God is. And, and to help put in perspective how much lower we are than God I mean, we, look, we think about his omnipotence, you know, how powerful he is and all this stuff, the creation alone, how complicated everything is that exists here, how everything works so well together, how there's an entire ecosystem that's fragile yet robust at the same time and, and able to, uh, you know, adapt and, and, and just so many different things. It's incredibly amazing when you look at God's creation, how complicated everything is and how foolish we would ever be to think that we could even duplicate and mirror what God has done by speaking it into existence. Just, just to, man, God is so far and above away from us. But, and, and to have some fools thinking that they're like God, right? <laughs> some people just getting so full of themselves, they literally are just blind and can't even see a millimeter in front of their eyes. They're so blinded by their own pride to, to ever compare themselves to God. I'm going to read for you from Luke 12. You should be in Psalm 147. Luke 12, 6. Jesus said, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. So we see two things mentioned here. One He's talking about sparrows. He says, aren't five sparrows just sold for two, far, uh, two farthings? That's not very much money. It's like, these things are cheap. These things are a dime a dozen, right? You're talking about sparrows. There's so many sparrows in the world, and they're just being bought and sold every day, and they're just coming and going, and you've got sparrows and sparrows and sparrows and sparrows. All throughout history, there's all these sparrows being born, being sold, dying. It says, not one of them is forgotten before God. And... Does God really care about the sparrows? No, he's saying the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now think about that. How many hairs do you have on your head? A lot, right? Those are all numbered. God knows every single one of those hairs on your head. Not just that. Look at Psalm 147, verse number four. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. I don't even know how many stars there are. But it's a lot. And I say a lot, that's an extreme understatement. I mean, there's just, just some huge magnitude number of stars that, like, we can't name them all. God knows every single one individually by their name. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. God's knowledge, His understanding, it's infinite. So think about this now, and this is what blew me away. You think about the stars, you think about the sparrows, you think about the hairs of your head. 
And I just think about the hairs of my head. Okay, now translate that into 6 billion, 7 billion people just alive at once and however many sparrows. And then how about all of history, all of time? And God knows all of it. All of it. You're talking about a memory bank. <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that blows my mind. My mind's about ready to blow up just thinking about how much God knows. Okay, because that, 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 it hurts. Like, how could you know so much? Because he's God. And God knows, every, and then, I mean, every thought of your heart. And, and how do you think he's going to be able to judge people? Because he knows everything that they've done and everything that they've thought. And, you know, every person of all time, all existence. I don't even know how many people that is. I mean, obviously, we're still going, and people are still being born. That's incredible. I mean, that's amazing. That's awesome. God knows it. God's always known it. God knew it before it started. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read from Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46, verse number 9. The Bible reads, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Yeah, I'd say. How can there be? Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. There you've got his omniscience declaring the end from the beginning. From ancient times, the things are not yet done. So way back in ancient times, he was already able to foretell all the things that are going to happen in the future because he knows it all because he's outside of that. Now, he also says, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. There's his omnipotence. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to do what I want. And who are you? <laughs> and God's the only one that could have that attitude. Acts chapter 2, now we're going to get into more of this foreknowledge and how it applies kind of more specifically to us, right? And, and especially when it comes to salvation and God's foreknowledge and what all of that means. What happens is we can look at some truths about God, and they're solid. I mean, there's, there is no, these are indisputable facts and truths about God and who he is and, and what he knows and his knowledge is infinite. He's known the beginning from the end and everything else. The problem comes in is when people try to deduce things from those facts and from those knowledge and start using philosophy and start interpreting things that aren't in Scripture to come up with doctrines. And that's exactly what Calvinism is, okay? Acts chapter 2, verse number 22, the Bible says, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So right here we see the foreknowledge of God about Jesus Christ being delivered up to be crucified, right? So God already knew that. Of course he did. The Bible says that Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, even though he wasn't really crucified until the time, you know, the timeline happened in our understanding of time. But because God is outside of time, he's able to know, yeah, he's slain. He's been slain from the foundation of the world. Why? Because God already knew the whole course of events and how they're going to happen. God knows the beginning from the end. He's not bound by time. Ephesians chapter 1 and Romans chapter 8, the last two places I'm going to actually turn to in Scripture, both of these passages are Scriptures that are abused by Calvinists. Ephesians chapter 1, Romans chapter 8, I'm sure you're well familiar with them if you deal with any Calvinists for any length of time because these are the two places that they love to turn to. But see, nobody should have any problems turning to any passage in the Bible. And if you don't know how to handle the Scripture, then that should be something that you study. We should never be afraid of a, of a false prophet or of a false doctor. Like, man, I really hope, they, like, like we're not told me, you shouldn't be saying, like, man, I hope they don't go to James chapter 2 because I don't really know, you know. Well, you know what? Study that and learn it. 
why don't you take the time then and, and get to know what the passage is really saying so that way you can understand it and you're not just left lacking without an answer. We can go to Romans 8 and 9 and Ephesians 1 all day with some stupid Calvinist because it doesn't say what they're trying to make it say. But we need to make sure we understand the scripture enough to be able to give an answer and explain what is it saying then, right? Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3, the Bible reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So people will take this verse and they'll say, See, he just chose us. I mean, before the foundation of the world, we weren't even alive yet, and yet he just chose us. And just was like, okay, you're saved. And this is a Cal this is this is just so you guys, if you don't know, I'm gonna break Calvinism down to really, really, really stupid, simple level, without without all the theology, of just saying God is a God that says, if you if you're to line up ten people, right, just just line them up, and here's people that are gonna exist in the future, saved, not saved, not saved, saved, not saved, not saved, not saved, not saved, not, and just because it's God's will. Because that's just what God wants. And that's, that's in, a, in a really simplified version of what account. Now, they might not like that characterization of their belief system because it sounds stupid and it sounds really bad. But that's because it is both stupid and really bad. <laughs> and when you break it down at the end of the day, that's what it is. Now, I will take time in the future and I'm going to do a more thorough Calvinism sermon because I don't, like, like if I want to reach people with this stuff, I want to be able to prove it in and out and not, you know, misrepresent. Now, I don't believe that's a misrepresentation of what they believe, but I don't, I don't you know, I like to, because I'll let them hang themselves with their own words and show what they believe, why it's wrong from Scripture. I don't need to make anything up. I'm not trying to make anything up about what they believe. But to me, it's just an easy way of stating what it really means and what it really is. But one of the things that they stumble at is they'll see a verse like this. And, you know, this, this, when you understand who God is, how God works, his omniscience, his omnipotence, and his omnipresence, you understand these things about God. This really isn't a problem of God cho you know, cho chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now turn to Romans chapter 8. We're going to get a little bit more insight also into the same exact subject of predestination before the world began, being foreordained, Romans chapter 8, because God knows, and this, is, and this is what is really critical to understanding all of these passages about the foreknowledge of God. Having foreknowledge of something does not imply that God makes people do things. The two are exclusive. They don't, they don't have to be one with the other all the time. You can know something without acting on it. God can be all-powerful and almighty without using his power all the time. He still has the attribute. He doesn't always have to act on it. God could know things in advance, and he could make things happen based on foreknowledge in advance without interrupting free will at the same time. Think about it. God can cause, and, and here's another thing that we don't know also. We don't know to what extent the spiritual world bears on our physical world. We know that there are wars going on. We know that there's devils and we know that there's angels. And we know that the angels are, are ministering spirits. And we know that there's devils like Satan standing at the right hand of David to, to oppose him. But what does that really mean in the physical world? How does that play itself out 
We don't know all the details on it. How is it that you know the, the spiritual wickedness in high places, these, these devils that are manipulating and controlling people who are in power, how are they completely able to get in their ear and kind of steer them the way they want to steer them? I don't fully understand it. Maybe someone else does. I don't get all the inner workings of how the two relate together, but we do know that they do have an impact. We see that from Scripture. That's very clear. That is very clear. How does that all relate with our free wills? I don't know, except I know that we do have free will. Amen. Because the Bible, again, if we didn't have free will, then you wouldn't have such a thing as a free will offering. Right. I mean, it really is that simple. We don't, I'm not even going to go to prove free will. I've done that before in other sermons, but how many times does the Bible list a free will offering? You can't say that people don't have a free will and have a free will offering. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense at all. It's just completely contradictory to say, well, God made you give that free will offering. Oh, man. But they want to get real complicated and technical and philosophical and well, we'll see if he knew that you were going to do that. And, you know, it's foreknowledge doesn't make God make you do things. It's just foreknowledge. Romans 8, 29, I believe, spells this out very clearly. The Bible says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So there's this whole chain of events of things that happen with people who are predestinated. So you could say, I was predestinated to be saved. I was predestinated to, to, to um, be justified. I was predestinated to con be conformed to the image of his son. Okay, but the reason why is because God foreknew that I would choose to believe on Jesus Christ. That's why. He's able to predestinate and do these things because of his foreknowledge of a choice that we will make individually. So God knows the thoughts and intents of the hearts before people are even born because, again, he's outside of time. He's able to see what is this person's heart. The people that are seeking God, he's able to align where people are born and have influences in people's lives. And see, this, this goes on a really deep level. And I need to be careful on saying too much when we start going outside of the scope of things. But here is just a theory, okay, on how we can understand a truth. The truth is that God is a just judge. And I've had conversations with these people just about this recently, too. Um, you know, you think about specific situations uh, with people, and, and you know, there, there's always these common problems that people have. Well, what about this person who's never heard the gospel? How could God send this person to hell? Or one that I was thinking about more recently is just like, well, at what age? Because we don't know exactly what age God's holding people accountable for, and you know, people die at all various ages. And what about that nine-year-old that you know, like, that, you know, you're, you're starting to think like, how can this all work? Well, first of all, we know, we know without any shadow of doubt that God is just judge. God is just. God is long-suffering. God is merciful. God has all these great attributes, first of all. First and foremost, so that anything that God does is not going to be wrong or corrupt or, or you know, in any way just faulty. Never. Never will that be wrong. He has put an onus on us for preaching the gospel to every creature. That is something that he's given a job to us, which automatically doesn't make him responsible. However, here's what I believe, and this is where I'm starting to get into just a little bit more theory. When you think about God's foreknowledge of everything, and God forms and fashions everybody in the womb, and God knows who's going to be created and where and when, and God is able to set up influences in people's lives, I think, so that everybody has a chance of hearing the gospel. Amen. That's my personal belief, that, that that's one way of just making it so that everyone is without excuse in addition to his creation and everything else, that because God has, first of all, such 
an immeasurable amount of wisdom and knowledge and smarts and, and is completely capable of building a system and, 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 and creating people and knowing how it's all going to work out, providing them with free wills, and also knowing who's going to make choices that will influence other people and kind of allow for people to have the chance. Right. Just to have the chance. But where you start taking that too far is when you say, well, because God all knows this, knows this stuff, then he's just making it all happen himself. And that's just one step too far. Because then, then we're back to, well, that contradicts scripture. You can't even have a free will offer and you can't have anything about us having a will and choosing to walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh. And all these other instances where, where we have this decision to make, Choose you this day whom you'll serve. Well, I can't choose because God's already choose, chosen for me, right? That's where you go too far. And that's where you have to be careful. When you start dipping into the, the philosophical, theoretical type of area in your doctrine and what you believe, make dead sure that you're not already contradicting Scripture somewhere else. You have to. So you think about these things and, and try to apply them, but, but you really cannot. I mean, as soon as you cross the line, you go, well, wait, I'm wrong. Right, and that's what the Calvinists should have been doing a long time. Well, I'm, I'm, we're wrong on this because we're, we're contradicting some very clear scriptures here. God's foreknowledge and knowing everything does not force him into action that will violate a person's free will. And you know what? Even when it comes to the reprobate. Because there is a violation of free will in one sense that that person can never believe. And God makes it so that person can never believe. He still allows them to, to make decisions and choices and stuff, but there's one thing where that gets blotted out and darkened. They can't believe anymore. But see, they've already made that choice. God didn't make that choice for them. But he set it up. And, that's, and that's, he says, okay, that path, that option is cut off. And see, you know, the Calvinists believe in reprobates. But that's because they think it's all just foreordained from, you know, they, they believe it, but for the wrong reasons. And another reason to just know your Bible well, because if you don't want someone accusing you of being a Calvinist. See, people accuse us of being Calvinists because we believe in uh, one saved, always saved. Where the Calvinists, you know, if you're, you know, every Calvinist thinks that they're chosen anyways, right? I mean, there's no one that's a Calvinist that thinks that they weren't chosen of God, right? Well, I just happen to be one of those people, but um, they believe in the eternal security of the believer in the sense of, well, I mean, if God chose you, then there's nothing that can change that at all, right? Because that's God's will. The same way if God chose you to be damned, then nothing can change that either. So that's how their, their version, their twisted version of the truth, right? We believe that God preserves us God keeps us because he's given us eternal life through our choice of putting our faith in Jesus Christ. That secures us and saves us, whereas the reprobate is damned by their choice of rejecting the gospel and not receiving Christ and becoming damned in that sense. It's not just God hammering it out of, of one will versus another. So... I think we're going to call it at that with the omniscience, a very, very important point to understand about, about who God is and his attributes, knowing that God knows everything. It should help modify our own behavior. Your walk before God ought to be one that is done keeping in mind that God sees everything. And when you hit tough times, know that God already knew that that was going to happen and look to him for help instead of pointing a finger. Again, God knew it was going to happen doesn't mean God caused it to happen. People get the bad attitude of pointing the finger at God saying, God, you knew this was going to happen. Why did you let this happen? Instead of God knew this was going to happen. Now, did you provide a way out for me, a way of help? God, I need your help. Turn to him for help instead of blaming him. See, Job didn't blame God for where he was at. But he turned to God. God helped him. And God blessed him 
for retaining his integrity. He was right, and he went through a really hard time. And sometimes we go through hard times, we can't blame God for it. But let's take the comfort knowing, hey, God already knew this. And he already, he already has a way out. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you so much for, again, being who you are and, and for all that you know, Lord. Help us in our, in our weak, sinful condition to be able to walk pleasing in your sight. God, help us to have the proper, healthy fear and, and reverence and respect, knowing that you know all things. God, help us with our, um, in, our, in our lives and that we wouldn't be holding these secret sins, but that, we would, that you would help cleanse our heart and, and help us to walk in the Spirit and to um, increasingly just, just mortify the deeds of, of our body, of our flesh, Lord, and get our thoughts and our hearts under control. Uh, under the control of the Spirit, dear Lord, and not the flesh, and help us every day to, to walk as would be pleasing your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.